and sometimes I, I don't. Some of these problems I want to be able to work on my own. Agreed. Well, I'm not going to do all four of them. I'm only going to do one of each. But I'm saying we could. Do you have a. Anybody have a type that they want to get to so we don't miss it? Which one? Perfect. All right. Shh. Hey, well, chill back there. Which, um, which um, final review is this that we're doing? We're going to do both. We're just going to go back and forth. Which one are we doing first? Which everyone has multiplicity on it. Do you know the number? Uh, trying to find my review papers. It's right there. It's on 10. Yes, calculator. Though you shouldn't, you don't need a calculator to do it. It's on the yes calculator portion, but you don't need a calculator. So for number 10, it says find the x-intercepts. Well, how do you find an x-intercept? You have to factor it fully, right? So which one do you want to do there? Let's do a... Uh, so D. D looks like the one that might be kind of weird. If we're looking at this part D and we want to factor it fully, what are we going to pull out of there? X. I think we'll pull even more than that. A 4X. Right? If you pull out that 4X, you're left with... This is kind of like reverse distribution, right? We're pulling out... The things that are in common, which ended up being 4x. x squared minus 1. So my zeros are... How do I find my zeros? Or my, what are they called, x-intercepts? So what, what equal to 0? So 4x equals 0 yields me a... x equals 0. And the x squared minus 1 equals 0 yields me a? Equals plus or minus 1. So those are my three x-intercepts? How do I write x-intercepts if it asks for it in that way? You would have to do, um, you have to write, for the x-intercept, you have to write the coordinates. Yep. 1 comma 0. Negative 1 comma 0. Zero comma zero? Yes. Now here's where the real question kicks in. What does multiplicity mean? It means how many, like, like it refers to the exponent. How many times it happens, right? Is what you kind of you were thinking. Like how many times that, that root happens in the fully factored form? So we have three roots. Well, what's the total exponent is three, so the multiplicity for each of them is. Oh, it looks like it could be four. Or, oh, no, the leading one's three. So, it's three. so it has to be three, so they all have to be one, right? Oh. But that's not how you know it. That's just me, my brain saying, oh, there's a maximum number of three roots. There's three roots right there. They all have multiplicity of one. The real way to know is to go look at the exponent for each of them. There's an exponent right here of one, right? Whoa. Oh. There's an exponent right there of 1. And now here's kind of where it was a little bit harder to see. This actually isn't fully factored form. You could factor this out even more. You know how else this could factor and break down even more? You could write it as equals 4x, x plus 1, x minus 1. Right, And that's where you can see the multiplicity for each of those things being uh, 1. Because each of those little solutions, the 0, the negative 1, and the 1 has a 1 for it. No. What's the multiplicity? It's not the highest exponent. What is the multiplicity? How many times that root occurs? Oh. How many times that x-intercept happens? Um, so what does that mean if they're all one? We had an acronym for that. This is the acronym. Even bounces. 
odd crosses. So what that means is that at each of these things, it crosses the x-axis, right? So at 1, 0, negative 1, 0, and 0, 0, it's going to cross the x-axis. And really, if we're going to be a hero about this, we could say, I know the end behavior too. Line or parabola? It's a happy line, right? So it should look like this. Boom. Boom. Cross, cross, cross. Probably looks something like that. Why is both still on? You know, it doesn't say you're supposed to, but we'd already done the multiplicity. And end behavior is real quick and dirty. But here, let's look at one uh, real quick. Let's just look at one that has multiplicity of two so you can see where the multiplicity changes. I think C would have a multiplicity of two. What would you factor out of this thing? I do x squared, yeah. So the answer to D we found was on. Those are your three x intercepts. Those are your multiplicities. And what does it mean? They all cross, would be what I would say. But this one's going to have a different thing. This one's going to have some crossing and some not. So that's why I wanted to do C as well. You pull out that x squared, you get x squared outside of x squared minus 9, which yields you some roots of, what does that make your x-intercepts? I see a 0 comma 0 for that x squared. I see a positive 3. And I see a negative 3. Yeah. Oops. And what's the multiplicity for each of those? One of them is different. The 0 over 0 has... This is where I want to do this one for. The 0 over 0 has a multiplicity of 2. How did we know that? This thing, right? That, 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 that. The 0 goes with the x squared. Because technically, if we set it equal to 0, x squared equals 0 turns it into 0, right? And that happens twice. There's two of them. That's how we knew that multiplicity. And 2 plus 1 plus 1 is 4, so it added up to our thing. That's good. That's A-OK. -okay. So what that means is we've got a even bounces. We've got a bounce, cross, cross. That's what we've got going on there. That's a good question and not obvious. So thank you. Anybody else got any other important ones before we just start? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll also post this online. Make sure it's video and notes are posted. Yeah, just the screen what and the, the voice. Multiplicity before? Total? Yes. For each root, it's different, right? Total multiplicity, sure, you could say it's technically four, but the multiplicity of the root. What's the end behavior for the power of four again? Just like power two. Uh, par parabolic. Any even one is parabolic. So x2 looks like that. x4 is just the same thing but a little wider. x6, a little wider. Negative would flip it upside down. X is a line. X3 is a line with a little jig. X5 is a line with two little jigs. But we kind of always ignore the middle when we're talking about end behavior. So they end up looking the same end behavior wise for all of those. So even, parabola, par parabola, odd, line. And then the happy or sad kind of, I just think about happy means a smile, sad means a frown. And then for the line stuff, just think about a bank account. Happy is what you would want your bank account doing. And sad is what you would not want your bank account doing. For if the line's going up or down. Or stocks or whatever. So the reason I graphed this first one going up like this is because it's a happy line because it's positive. That 4x cubed is positive. So it should be a happy line. All right, let's go. What else we got? Don't want to waste any time today. On calculator or not? Is that the as asymptote one? Okay. Fine. Ooh, this is a gimme. You get this one, this is a gimme. This is not even like, 
the tough the toughest one on, you know what i'm saying this is great yes you should love this type because you don't have to do the whole graph the whole thing and do like the five different things it's just one of those five things so what's the rule for vertical asymptotes it's a super simple rule bottom equals zero you're done with the math part now you have to do like the algebra and the moving stuff back and forth thing but that's the only pre-cal part of like knowing something right the other part is like algebra that's the pre-cal step bottom equal to zero so which one of these you want to do let's do the top one i know how to do that one let okay <laughs> so um i would do is um take okay. out i would do that too um, um, keep us t keep talking us through it. Line is uh, six, and then I would um factor it. That look looks like a um. Wait 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 wait. wait. Uh, it looks like a. Wait 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 wait. wait. Uh, Do something else first. Equal zero. No. No, but, but, I, but see, this is this kind of factoring, I don't really need the quadratic formula because I know that. No, no, no. I'm saying do the easy thing first. Do a really easy thing first. There's a really easy thing you can do before you factor. Um, it's not going to change your answer. You are going to end up in the right spot. But there's a really easy Oh, to, to make the three become zero. Divide by three on both sides? Yeah. Now keep now keep talking us through what you were I was talking. Writing it, I was just writing it a different way. I got you. But um, so basically we have x um plus three and x minus two. How did you know that for the other people pay, paying attention that didn't? Well, because I know that three times negative two is negative six, and then three plus negative two is one. So times for this one, x that's not a good thing. Times to get this thing, right? Yeah. And Plus to get this thing. Yeah. Okay. So that means basically when you look at the when you look at the um x this x plus three equals zero x minus two equals zero x would equal negative three and x is also equal positive two. So your vertical asymptotes mm -hmm. um would be um x equals negative three and x equals two. Love it. You tell me. That's a good question. Usually we make a coordinate, right? What? I'm listening. No is the right answer, but why? Why no coordinate? Hmm? It's a whole line. What kind of line? Vertical line, right? And it's not actually part of the graph. It's a dashed line, right? It's technically a fake line telling us what not to touch. It's not a real line picking points, right? If we were to plot a point, that would be kind of like saying, this is on my graph. No good. Now, if you want to plot a billion invisible points going up and down, that's what it is. It's a billion invisible points saying, none of these better be on the graph. Because if any of these are on the graph, you know what's good? That, that makes the problem? Divide by zero. And that's bad. So this is an infinite set of points. If you want to really think about it in terms of what this is, these are both infinite sets of points. Negative 3, 1. Negative 3, 2. Negative 3, 3. Negative 3.92. Like, you know what I'm saying? This is an infinite set of points that better not be on the graph is what it is. This is saying, hey, here's a list of points that can't exist, that are not in my domain, that are domain restrictions. If I were to write the domain, I'd probably write infinity to negative 3, unite it with negative 3 to 2, unite it with 2 to infinity. Because basically that's just saying, hey, every real number is good except for these two numbers, negative 3 and 2. Not what it was asking, just a side tangent of what different types of questions there were over the years. That's a good question. You should, I don't know, I think it might... I'm always curious about test taking strategies. And if the better test taking strategy is go through and find the ones you know, that way you don't waste all your brain power on a really hard one. And then when you get to an easy one, you screw it up because you're toast. It's like, that's one you should know, right? That's one that shouldn't take very long and you should know pretty quick. Go find like that. And then like, honestly, 
This is probably one we should know pretty quick. Maybe not. That's a little harder. That's actually not that hard. But. No, no, no. But what I'm saying, oh, like this one right here, 15. 15 we should know, I hope. So it's like, go find these easy ones and don't get tied up in this graph of rational function when you've got a slope for the same amount of points right above it. Like, I don't know. I just think that's worth strategizing. All right, what else we got? Look through both of them. Let me know. What does point slope form look, form look like again? Good question. Oh, I didn't because it's been a while. It has. There's two, there's two main formulas. There's two main formulas. Let's write them both even though this one's asking for one of them, just in case. So what is point slope form and then what is the other one? Well, I know what the x-intercept form. What is that? The y-intercept form is where you have like y equals um, the, the um, slope. Um, plus B or minus B. Careful. Is it on the slope X? MX plus B. Plus B. And that is called slope intercept form. That is not what they're asking us for, but it's still a good thing to know. They are asking us for point slope form. And anybody remember that one? Oh no, we do need to know this. This is important. This is like you have like x, like x two, x one. You do. You do have some of that weird stuff. It uh, starts. It starts the same. It starts the same as y. It starts exactly the same. But like you just said, you have x twos and y ones and stuff like that. So, so it starts exactly the same. You start right your y, so and you subtract y one. Oh, that's like on one side of the equal And then on the other side, it's, it also starts kind of very similar. Look sharp. You're welcome. Your slope stays there, but what instead of it's x minus, x one. and you're done. All right. That's it. So for which one of these four do we want to do? It doesn't matter. They're all the same. It literally doesn't matter. You're just going to plug stuff in. So y minus, you said c, negative 6 equals, wait, what? Why did I do that? What did I do wrong? You put two negatives. Yeah, that's my slope. I was just being silly. y minus 4, right? Equals. Then I can pull that slope in. Negative six. What is it if you ask if that's a zero? Ooh, it would just be x, but I'm going to go ahead and write it so everybody sees it anyways. But I know what you're saying. You can write it and you would get full credit. x minus zero. Cool with that? You, yeah. If it says slope intercept form, you just leave it like that. Or, I'm sorry, point slope form, you leave it like that. But if it says slope intercept form, you might have to distribute that negative six and move the four over. But it doesn't. I think it's this. I'm giving you what it's mostly likely going to ask. So I'm giving you the problem. It's going to be one of those four problems. Do all four. Go home and practice every single one of these problems. So even if we didn't include that zero and then we just put You get full credit. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, look through for some more challenging ones. Sixteen C. Oh, that's kind of wonky because they threw that extra thing in there. That was not nice of them. Okay, okay, okay. This is fun. Oh, this is so fun. Holy smokes. Um, there's just when you look at it, your brain could be like, "Oh, I kind of want to do it by just transformations," because you don't. I'm not saying this is how you would do it. I'm just saying my brain when I see this, I'm like. This plus three always was something in our brain. What was that plus three always? Up by three, right? Wait a second. This minus three was always something because it's inside the function. What was that minus three? 
to the right three, right? So that's what I did in my brain when I first saw it because I, oh, this is cool. You don't have to do that. You can do the math to work it out and make it get a common denominator and stuff. My brain just saw that quickly and was like, oh, there's no square. There's no nothing. I can just jump straight to it and do that. So the original one over X, anybody remember what that looks like? This is pretty important. It looks, it, it looks like the classic thing we did that were really hard, but the simplest version. Of, you know, like the really hard stuff we did when it was like U's and W's and backwards and forwards and there's oh, something in the middle sometimes. Um, it's like this. It's the most simplest version of that. It's like. It's that. Well, <laughs> that's it. That's one of our X, but right? It says to grab. It doesn't say sketch to grab. So if I was to so grab it, I would it's sketch. No, graph paper. It's sketch. Just sketch, though. Don't waste all your time doing that. They will give you the graph. They'll give you the graph if the label's already labeled. Um, um, um. So then I could take that thing and just go up three. So my horizontal asymptote goes up by three, right? Basically. And my vertical asymptote goes over by three. And then I just draw the exact same thing. And you're pretty much done. That's that. Now, here's what you could do. You could, you don't have to do, that would be me doing it, jumping to it, because I recognize those two quick shifts. I can't recognize those two quick shifts for the other stuff. For the other three of these, I can't, right? So what you could have done is said, I need to get a common denominator. Here, let me go down here and do it in the math way. How do you get a common denominator for these two things? Um, Not by x minus 3, but by, because that didn't give us a common denominator. No. By 1. You multiply by 1, which is x minus 3 over x minus 3. Oh, you said x minus 3. You didn't say x minus 3 over x minus. No, it matters. Because what the reason it matters so much is because if we multiply one side by x minus 3, you know what we have to do now? Multiply the other side by it. But if we multiply by one side by 1, do you know what we don't have to do? Well, we do technically have to do it, but it stays the same. So you're allowed to go and multiply that by 1 and it not change that f of x over there. Because remember, there's that right there. There's that f of x. But if you were going to jump in and just do x plus 3 on one side, not x plus 3 over x plus 3, now you have to do it to the f of x, and now we've just lost everything because I don't know how to do that. Like, I don't know how to solve f of x times x minus 3 on the left side. That's too weird looking. Okay, so our common denominator, now we've got, ooh, 1 plus 3x minus 9 over x minus 3, which is... 3x minus 8. And where's my vertical asymptote here? At 3, does that make sense with the thing we just graphed? Well, I should do it in blue, not red. Look at our vertical asymptote on the graph above. It worked out. Where, how do I find a horizontal asymptote? The first two things, this highlighted thing right there. And are they the same? You know what I'm, You see it? 3x, what is 3x over x? What does that equal? There's my ha. Does that check out with the thing from above? Both ways work. If that was 3x over 3x, it would just be 1. The horizontal asymptote. You mean 3x over 1? Wait, say it again. If that was 3x minus 8 over 3x minus 3 or something. 3x minus 8 over. You're saying if it was this, would it just be 1? Yes, it's the fraction. But it's not the fraction if this would have been, this is important note, squared on the top. Now what is that? This is important. Top bigger? Infinity. Top smaller? Zero. Same fraction. That's just the exponent, yes, yes. I know it's so hard to say bigger. I should, you, you should, yes, thank you. Exponent. Look at the exponent. Exponent. But then also when you look at this fraction, the fraction is not the exponent. The fraction that you're looking at, like you said earlier, is that coefficient. So it's kind of like you're looking at both, but you're knowing which one does what. The coefficients give you your asymptote. The fractions tell you. Infinite, zero, or use it. 
That's important. Those are important three notes. But it is cool that you could use the shifty thing like we did a second ago, or you could work it out with the math and get the same thing, which I think is kind of interesting to note. So like when I, when you look at a problem like that, my initial brain is like, oh, there's a lot of moving around and common denominator stuff. But then the second thought was, oh, but it's actually just two simple shifts. I could just do those two things. Thank you. Good question. That's a really good question. Yo. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Right. It doesn't. Most of these calculator ones don't need a calculator. The only ones that need a calculator are freaking right here where you don't know the sign of 25 and I don't know the sign of 25. So that's the literal only reason you need a calculator is for that. And back in the day, they didn't have calculators. You know what they had? No. Well, that's no, they in between the calculator and the abacus. Um, they had trig tables that they would hand out, which were on the back of your test or something. If you look up a trig table, it's literally the sign of everything 1 to 360. And the cosine of everything 1 to 360 with like four decimal places or whatever. But your calculator gives you infinite decimal places. Which, which triangle one? There's a lot. No, they're all different. <laughs> they're all different. You got to be careful. Pick one. Pick one. Because they're all different. And we need to look at them. You don't put the sides wherever you want if it gives you sign. Because now you have to label opposite hypotenuse, right? If it gives you a right angle, you can't put the sides wherever you want because that's important. Like it matters what which one we're working on. Which one are you talking about? No, you can't say all of them. We have to go one at a time. You have to. I, it matters. They're all different problems. Okay, nine. There you go. Okay, so for nine, they give us an angle and two sides. In each of the following, there are. Zero, one, or two solutions. Determine all solutions. Okay, so they give us an angle. Which one do you want to do? 120? So I'm actually going to draw that a little better because 120 is a pretty big angle, right? One twenty for A. Um, one second. Correct. Now it doesn't matter where you put the other one, right? Like it would be identical. So I'm gonna pick a color for actually I'm gonna change colors here. Let's make this triangle a neutral color. That way each of these sides can be a color. So let's call this angle B. And side B equals one ninety five. And call this angle C. Inside C equals, what do you want to, just leave it, lowercase c? Okay, we did definitely say for every single triangle one, so here's a, here's a general rule, even though I just said there's not general rules. Here's a general rule. Every single triangle one is going to be the same steps. There's only one hard step, then one medium step, then one easy step, right? Y'all remember that, like kind of saying that? So the steps for most triangle problems will be cosines, sines, then angles equals 180. Those will be the steps for most of them. And sometimes you don't have to do cosines if you see it. Sometimes you can skip straight ahead. But if you can't skip ahead, you have to do cosines. So, oh, I, we can do sines here. Yeah? What, how can we do sines here? So this one actually does let us skip ahead to the middle step. How can we do the law of sines? Okay, hang on. You're saying sine of 120 over 250 equals the cosine of B. Oh. What? No, I know. I wrote it wrong. And here's where you... So you're saying calculator wise help. Here's where the calculator helps. I don't know how to do arc sine without a calculator, right? This is the only reason you have one slash need one. Okay, so let's get B. So B actually equals, if you do the algebra real carefully and good, the arc sine of 195 times the sine of 120 over 250. 
which is going to be approximated something. You got it? Um, uh, no, the reason I'm confused by that question. I'm listening. How do we know to use what? But then you said something about a hypotenuse. Why is there no hypotenuse? This is a good good line of thinking. Right Boom, perfect. Because it's not a right triangle. If it's not a right triangle, if you see a triangle that's not right, your brain needs to think this right here. Right here. Cosines, sines, angles equals 180. If it's not a right triangle, your brain has to think step one, step two, step three. And then even though it sucks, oh, they're not there anymore. Your brain has to know the law of cosines, know the law of sines, and know that thing and say, I want to start here. If I can do three first, I'm going to do it. But I can hardly ever will it be just start at three. Most of the time, it's going to be start at cosines, then hit sines, then hit 180. This one, they let us skip straight to the law of sines because they were just nice enough to give us th this. Well, it doesn't even matter that. This is what matters the most right there. That matching thing matters so good. Because that's what really gives it to us. Because it doesn't matter what else they give to us. If you look at it, it didn't matter had they given us this, 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 or this. We could find any of them, right? Because we have two things that match that are on the same thing. So it doesn't matter what the other thing is. We're going to be getting three out of four based on that. Now, had they not given us that, had they given us like side, side, angle, all different things, then we would have had to go to the law of cosines because there wasn't a pair. If they give you a pair of matching things like that, A, B, or C, it doesn't matter. You can jump straight to law of sines. No matching things. What's the, what was the law of cosines? That's a good question. Even though we don't have to use it, let's remember it. It was C squared, though it doesn't have to be C. It could be A squared if it's like opposite, right? I wish that there was a better way to think about this. C squared equals A squared plus B squared. So it's real similar to your right triangle hypotenuse. They just subtract a little bit from it because it's not perfect. What do they subtract from it? 2A, B, cosine, theta. Whoa, sorry. Not theta. Cosine of C, where C matches this thing right there. It's not the same thing. It's the opposite one. So that's, which one's lowercase? Usually this one? So that's lowercase C. Right. Well, and you don't ever do the cosine of a side. So you'll know. I hope. And then so the law of sines then just to be safe is sine of A equals sine of B equals sine of C where you divide by the opposite side A, B, C. All right, did anybody hit me up with that, uh, that B angle? Oh, 32.5? No, I have 42.49. I'm going to go ahead and, yeah, yeah, let's do 49, just to be safe. I was going to, okay. But this is the scary part, especially, I think there's only one on the test that's like this. And they let you know, hey, we're looking for one, two, or zero solutions. We did the inverse sign, right? Where is 42 degrees on the unit circle? Near 45? Is there another spot that has the same sign? The, or the, when you see sign, think y value. That's another spot that has the same thing, right? So what is that uh, angle right there? We know that this green angle is 42.9. That other angle is 180 minus 42.49. And right there, 137, technically 51. Yeah, because it's, if it's complementary. Um, well, I can already tell. You can already tell what? Right away. I can already tell that there's only one solution. There's only one solution because? Because one, 137.50 plus 120 is way over 180. It's way over 180 already, right? Two obtuse angles are done. Toast. So this is not even possible, even though it was, we had to check it. Not possible. 
it'd probably be, we'd be way more possible over here where your first angle was 40, right? Probably be way more possible over there than an angle of 120 starting out. That's crazy. What? Yes, and then it would be two separate triangles and you'd have to solve both of them. Let me tell you real quick. I'll tell you real quick. Here's some sides. Here's an angle. Determine whether the given measurements produce one triangle, two triangles, or no triangle. Solve each triangle that results. Round your links to the nearest tenth of an angle. Triangle is not to scale. That's why I put six of them on practice there because that's more like I wanted you to practice a bunch of them. No, you should do two triangles. There's plenty of room on the thing to split it up into two triangles. If that would have been a small angle, like let's say that ended up being 45, which is fine. Like it wouldn't have been, but if it would have ended up being 45, which is totally okay, um, I would have drawn a separate triangle. And there's here there's not plenty of room. On the test, there's plenty of room to do two full triangles. But I don't know. Maybe the test is a zero triangle thing. I haven't done it yet. Because now you've got two different... Oh, you're saying you could be like B1 equals 42.49 42 and B2 equals 137.51? You're saying do something like that and just keep working it out, keeping them straight? I'd be okay with that, actually. Yeah, that's actually kind of clean. But as long as now... Now what I got to go back and do, though, is... Right, A1 for, like, so now guess what I'm writing right here. What does A1 equal? And what does A2 equal? No, it's also 120. That didn't change. That's how we got our thing. You know what I'm saying? So you're welcome to do that. That's fine. But <laughs> yes, so let's go. But, but we can't do it here because it's impossible. But on a different one, it might be possible. But let's see. Uh, so what is the value of C now? We can do the easy way to get the value of C. Uppercase C. Uppercase C, thank you. 180 minus 42.49 minus 120. 17 point what? So C is 17.51? Yes, it does say. It says find all sides, all angles. And then how do we get that last C over there? Law of signs to get it? Yep. <clears throat> it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. But you didn't have to do cosines for it. That's nice. That's nice that on this one, they didn't make you do the law of cosines. Because if they would have, now this is the hardest problem on the test because it can possibly be two different problems and the law of cosines on both would have been ugly. So it is nice that they said, hey, here's the hard problem. But it's just going to be law of signs the whole time. Anybody get C? Let me know when you do it. And I'll write it so we can leave it for the class or for the notes. So the answer would be um, 17.31. That's what I heard. Did anybody else get that? We should all be doing it. Freaking not just me. Yeah. But what'd you get for C? No, C. <laughs> I'm talking about lower case now, right? Yeah, indeed. I'm not doing it. I'm not. Y'all do it. But there's six, there's six things to practice there. That's a good. That's a lot of practicing on this type of problem. I'm sorry, y'all. This is a lot of work. I know. No, nope, doesn't matter. Sign B or sign A. Or if you want to, this is what I used to do when I was doing. I remember back in the day doing this. I would make up a variable. I think I always called it Q or something. And I would do that actual fraction, whatever that fraction was. Because look, all of these better be the same thing, right? You see these three highlighted things right here? They're all technically going to equal the same number, right? If you did them. Because setting them equal to each other is equaling them. So I always would used to like say Q equals this. Hey, that's my, uh, I don't know what you want to call it. You want to call it your proportion of triangles or your angular ratio or whatever. I don't, it doesn't have a name. But I used to always like find that at the beginning of the problem as soon as I could. And I'd be like, oh, here's my proportion. So that next time when you go to solve one, you don't have to do a proportion. You just set your 
angle over side equal to that number. You see what I'm saying? Like those are all the same number. I don't know what that number is. You could find it, but I used to do that at the beginning of the problem. I'd be like, oh, my proportional angle is this. That way, whenever you're trying to find one of the three sides, you just go straight to that number. What? What unit do I don't know. <laughs> this, is just, uh, this is putting it in degrees. Anybody else get 86.85 for their side length? I did. That makes sense because you've got a 195 and a 250. So it makes sense that it would have to shrink. Otherwise, that would be an obtuser angle. For it. If it weren't shrinking, if it weren't smaller than the other two, if it were like bigger than the other two, that wouldn't make any sense for a 17 degree angle. So you can kind of think about it in that brain. Okay, I don't know what unit we learned this in. I'm so sorry. I wish I did. But those six problems are enough to practice right there alone. Just to keep rolling through it and practicing. Whatever angle at the top had law of sines, law of cosines is what we learned when you look at the top of the thing. So it's probably called law of sines, law of cosines. The unit section, I just don't know what section that was. Explain uh, a yeah. squared plus b squared equals c squared doesn't apply to that because, because it's not a, uh, mm -hmm. a right. Yes. A right triangle. Actually, even if, yes, yes, that's exactly right. What I'm going to say is the formula is still a right triangle because what's the cosine of 90 on the unit circle? So what happens to that whole term for your right triangle? It goes away, and now you have your right triangle formula. That's where the formula comes from. They just kind of cut you short. In the same vein, there's that area formula. You remember this area formula? One half A, B, sine theta? Right? That's the formula for the area of a triangle, any triangle in the world, not just right. And then you say, well, I always thought the area is one half base times height. That's for a right triangle. And what's the sine of 90 degrees? One, there's your formula for one half base times height. So what we've done this year is say, here's the formulas you learned. They're actually longer formulas for every triangle. We just shorten them for easiness for third grade, fourth grade year. Number one? Yeah. On calculator or not calculator? Minimum or maximum point? Dude, you see this, you say, give me that. That's that's a gimme. This is like literally a gimme. You do it right away, I think. The other one, I wouldn't say that triangle one's a gimme. I'd say that triangle one's hard, and maybe I'll do it last. This one is due first, because if you see this type of problem, minimum and maximum. Minimum and maximum. Look, these are all the same type of problem. Or not problem, shape. These are all parabolas. Mm -hmm. So how do you find the minimum or maximum of parabola? Find the um, vertex. Yes. And heck, before we even find the vertex, I can tell you right now without doing any math whether it has a min or a max. Right now. Which one are we on? Uh, number one one. On the, no, on the calculator number one. So right now I can tell you min or max for the first one. What do you think? Why do you say minimum so quickly? Happy parabola. Bottom of the ocean, min, right? What about B? Min. Sad parabola, sad space. That looks like a mountain with the top, max. Sad parabola, mountain, max. Happy parabola, ocean, min. So there's, yeah, boom, half of your problem's done. <laughs> You'll get half the points right there just for knowing that. Because I think it says determine whether it has a min or max and what it is. So you get half the points just for knowing it's a minimum right there. Cool. And that is based on this leading term. Cool. You don't, it doesn't say graph it. It just says determine the point. So we're not done. We're halfway done. The formula that you need to know. Okay. You <laughs> remember we learned completing the squares back in the day, but then we said, don't ever use this because there's a better way to do it. What's that better way? Yes. Where'd you get that from? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The quadratic formula. If you forget the formula, just remember the quadratic formula. Negative B plus or minus square root. B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. And then you say, but I don't care about the parabola. I only care about the vertex. Don't give me that discriminant. Just give me where it turns around and has a slope of zero is the math behind that. Um... So negative B over 2A? 
So which of these ones do we want to do? Sure. Oh, the first one's scary. It doesn't have a C value. Yeah, but there's also no C in this formula, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, but we're just using A, B. Just don't get tripped up and call 3C and B0. Be, know which one's which. Know which letter goes with which exponent. Um, so negative, negative 3 over 2 times 3 is 1 over 2. But that's not a vertex. That's a number. That's an X value of the vertex. Right? Now we throw it right back in the formula. Looks like we're getting a fraction here. Sorry about that. 3 times 1 over 2 squared minus 3 times 1 over 2 equals 3 fourths minus 3 over 2 equals 3 fourths minus 6 over 4 equals negative 3 over 4. And that is the dot, 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 y value of the vertex. So we've got the point, 1 half, comma, negative 3 over 4. I'll zoom out. That is way easier than completing the square. <laughs> completing the square was take b, square it, divide by 2, determine which, yeah. I don't think I'll ever teach completing the square again. Yes? He was just saying, do we have to know that b over 2a? I know. You want to take a break or you want to keep going? Okay, let's take a little break. Take a five-minute break. Look through. While we're taking this break, look through. Look through these and find a good one. Find a real good one to do. I'm gonna pause this video actually. All right, let's hop back into this. What else we got? Yeah. Is it on the first half? I think it's on no, but I don't remember. Do you know where it is? Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Determine without, find all solutions. Average rate of change. Yes. Well, I don't see a domain range. Though you could technically find the domain range for any problem. Oh, there's one. Find the domain for the following functions. In interval. That's good enough. There's three different ways you can write the domain, but this one's asking for an interval. So uh, domain only has three bad things, right? So let's just make a note of those three things, even though this problem only seems to have one. What are the three bad things for domain? Uh, it looks like on the calculator section, number four. The domain has three bad things. What are those three bad things? Any number over zero, bad. What else is bad? Square root of a negative number, bad. What else is bad? Hmm? That's fine. <laughs> what? If the square is zero. We got that already. Number over zero. There's one more bad thing. I'll give you a hint. It starts with log. Log, log zero. Log of zero, but also log of negative. Log. any negative number. Those are all bad. Those are all super bad things. Those are bad things that hurt the domain. So which of those four bad things have, are possible to happen here? Those, there's the four bad things. Which ones are even possible? Only the, what? Where do you see a square root in any of these problems? I don't see. I think it's only the top, only the top thing. There ain't no square roots and there ain't no logs. So it's only the top thing we're worried about. So all we're going to do is take a bottom and set it equal to zero. That's all we're going to do. What do you mean really? It's almost the exact same process as finding vertical asymptotes. It really is. 
with this type of ROM, not with a log. But equals. Well, no, don't set equals. Just take the bottom. Negative x squared minus x plus six equals zero. Okay. Ooh, any ideas? I don't care whatever you want. You can do whatever you want to do, but I'm down to do whatever. Factor out a negative one or multiply by negative one. It'll give you the same thing, right? I always think of it as factoring it out because that's just so we do the same thing all the time, every time. If you ever have anything here, factor it out. So we're factoring out a negative one, right? Plus x minus six. And then what do we do with that negative one? This is the same problem we had a second ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that Caden did it for us earlier. X plus three, X minus six. Okay, so what does that mean? X equals negative three and X equals two. What did we just find? Um, we found some... No, we found no. vertical asymptotes. It's important, yeah. If this were just that problem, those are x-intercepts, right? Those are x-intercepts of that parabola. For this whole problem, what are those called? Because this is the bottom, right? So these are technically vertical asymptotes. But we were actually trying to find domain. How does this even help us? Why even bother with that? Well, this is cool because that's the only two bad points on the whole thing, right? So we're going to start... I'm going to do a number line first, just so we can kind of see it. There's two bad points, right? So there's a hole at negative 3, and there's a hole at 2. Every other point is possible. So how do we write that in interval form? So it would be um, negative infinity. Negative infinity, working its way all the way up to? Negative 3. And does it include it? No. No. But what, how do we unite two brackets together <laughs> with a U at that spot? And then you go from... Um, not including negative 3. Not including 2 either. And not including 2. And then another U. And go... Not including 2 and then infinity. Yeah. That's a good way. I should start doing it always like that. That's a good way to look at it. So you can see what's happening as you write the, you, um, as you write the domain. Yeah, but don't. For this class, as I looked through the test. Yes, the other way to do it would be X is in the reals cut the set of negative 3, 2. That's what you would do. So, but wouldn't the answer be in interval? Yeah, no, this is, I'm sorry, we were just talking. This is it. It's not even in number line theory, it's in interval theory. How, that's a great question. How do you find x-intercepts? Yep. Top equals zero. How do you find the horizontal asymptote? So what is the horizontal asymptote here? Negative one. Yeah. Because neg one over negative one. Um, how do you, there's one more thing to find. I can't remember it. Ooh, that was it. Yeah, yeah. How do you find the y-intercept? Hmm. <laughs> That's the scary one. It's, this is the easiest one, actually. So why you, just you just, what do you mean everything? I mean, like, you plug the stuff into, wait. The stuff is not a good math word. Yeah, the stuff, is, I don't know how to explain it, but I don't know. Do you? How do you do it? How do you do it? I'm really interested. Isn't it like you plug in stuff and then what? Like make it zero? <laughs> what do you mean plug in the stuff? Plug in, plug in what F of zero is how you do it. What, what, you tell me? The whole thing. So you plug it, that's, the, that's that. So those are really the four things you can do. Set the top equal to zero, set the bottom equal to zero, horizontal asymptote is the first thing, and uh, plug in zero for everything is the y-intercept. Not part of this problem, but this is just good, I like this train of thought. 14. Ooh, this is my favorite type of problem. 
For uh, difference quotients? Definitely. Number 14. This is, oh, 14 on the calculator? Oh. Oh. Oh, wait, no, that was that one. That was it. Yeah. Difference quotient's great. Hang on. Oh, thank you. Freeze. You know, I've let, I've, I know, like, I've, I've done, like, the whole six minutes of the song. Really? What song? That's crazy. The Child Outside. <laughs> many people, it's because I was seeing it. <laughs> many, many people either stop sometime before the end of the first half or end at the, yeah. at the, at, at the end of the half, but there's actually a whole nother half that some people might not even know about. There is, because I used to do it every day with my, uh, one of my theater classes, and, uh, kids, like kids ate that up. They love that song. Love well, that in Disney. All right, um, let's do A. Just because you should, if you're gonna go practice one, practice A. Change maybe change those two numbers to any random two numbers and practice it again. If you're gonna practice one, all that does is make your life a little bit easier with the squared stuff. Like you don't have to worry about factoring out or uh, what's it called, foiling. Okay, so like I've said before, we've done this before. This is three distinct problems. This is the red problem, the blue problem, and the green problem, right? Best to do it as three separate problems. So what is f of x plus h? And this is so important, and nobody would hesitate even for a second if I asked Four you. Times if I asked you what's f of 1, nobody would hesitate. Not one person would hesitate. If I said, what's f of 1? What would you do? You would plug 1 in, right? Okay, so why is there a hesitation when I give you f of x plus h? There shouldn't be hesitation, though. It's the same exact thing. What are you going to do? Plug in what? x plus h where you see. Okay, it's the same thing. It just it looks bad, but it's not. It's the same exact thing. So you should get 4. But it says the function of x plus h. Right, but but what I'm saying, look at this, Caden. If I gave you f of 1, what would you do? I would put it into 4x. Did you hesitate? Did you hesitate at all to say, oh, I'm just going to plug 1 in? Your brain immediately went, I don't need, I don't care what it is. I'm just telling you. Your brain immediately said, oh, cool, I'll plug 1 in, right? Mm -hmm. So your brain should immediately say right here, oh, cool, I'll plug x plus h in. I don't care if I don't know it. I'm just going to plug it in. Oh, oh, you, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Um. It's the same thing. I'm, I'm confused. I, I, it's because, um, Shh, stop it. Yeah, why don't you put um, the x plus h into 4x plus 2? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. There shouldn't be hesitation there, just like there's no hesitation for f of 1, f of 2, f of 3. It's just a, a little bit uglier, but it's the same process. 4x plus 4h plus 2. Okay, what about the blue problem? What is f of x? 4x plus 2. And green problem, what is H? It's not. It don't do anything. <laughs> exactly. And now what do we do with those three answers? We plug them into this little formula. And we get 4X plus 4H plus 2 minus, minus parentheses 4X plus 2 divided by H. That's why I like doing this. And I might even put parentheses around the red problem. So your brain can see this is three problems that get mashed into one. It just is. I don't know. I just like, I don't want to skip one of the three problems. I want to see these as three problems that are going to get tied together. Did anything cool happen cancel wise? Yeah. What, what's going to cancel? Watch this negative gets distributed, right? So we end up with 4x plus 4h plus 2 minus 4x minus 2 over h. What, ha what cool thing happens there? The four X's and the twos cancel. And you're left with? Four H over H is just equals four. Done. That's cool. Guess what it always is going to be? That number. <laughs> if it's a single, uh, if, 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 it's, if it's to the power one. If it's to the power two, it's actually technically this number of times this number. Like 4x. Like this one's 4x plus 3 plus h. This one's 8x plus 4. This one's 9. Next year, you can do it that quickly.
Next year, you'll be able to do that quickly. Like, actually. What? Um, no, H is nothing. H just hangs out sometimes. And sometimes it goes away. But then as you take a limit and you say the limit as H approaches zero, it definitely goes away. Which is what you'll do next year to start the year off. Literally, very first week of the year, you'll learn this exact formula like really intensely. This is the most important formula in next year's or next semester's class. Which formula? This one. Though you'll get good at doing it without writing it all out. Like for instance, I can do that formula and I can say if I plug this into that formula, I'm going to get 8x plus 4 plus h. I know for a fact. Because you do this little thing where you like multiply this by that and then subtract 1 and then do the same thing here. There's 1 there times 4 gives you 4 and then subtract 1 gives you 0. Like a little bit process. So you'll get good at that and be able to do this. But if you don't remember that, you can plug it in this long formula and it works too. Which one? Non-calculator 11. Thank you. Thank you for... Oh, shoot. Yeah, we should definitely do this, huh? This is crazy that it's on there. Yeah. All right, here we go. Let's do it one step at a time. And they're going to have the blanks just like normal. Like, they're going to have... Here's a blank for each of these four. So you can garner some little points even if you mess up the whole thing. Like, amplitude's the easy one. You should get this point immediately right away no matter what. What? Which one do you want to do? B. What's the amplitude for B? Okay, please get that point. Oh, is this in the... Um... Yes, non-calculator. Immediately, please get B. Or, I don't know why I said B. I said A. Immediately, please get amplitude. Are we on B? Uh, yes, we are doing B. Thank you. Here we go. Do -do -do. Highlighted. Okay. Uh, phase shift, period, and graph. All right. Mm. Now, before we move on, we do have to do one manipulation. That was the easy, that was the gimme thing. We have to take the negative three out. So we're going to take this negative three outside there, right? And what's left on the inside? Theta plus pi over six. We took out a negative three. Um. I'm so sorry, because that's how fractions add and subtract. Um, On this one, I know everybody, I, I'm not oblivious that fractions suck. I'm not. So how do we know that when you take out the 3 and the power 2, it would make it would make power over 6? Um, let's see if there's a slower way to do it. Um, let's get a, com before we take it out, let's make it a, com there's, there's the thought, actually. Before we take it out, let's make a common denominator. So how do we make a common denominator of these two things? That would be how you could recognize it. How do you make these have a common denominator? You divide this by 2, but you can't just divide it by 2. What do you have to multiply it by? So technically, isn't that negative 6 over 2? Isn't that the same thing? Now we've got a common denominator. So now what are we going to factor out? How are we getting the Wait. That doesn't give us a common denominator. But yes, it does. But that doesn't help us factor something out. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Dang it, how did I know that that was what that was? Yeah, but I'm trying to figure out how to show that. How do you show that that's true? Yeah, I know. I'm just I'm just trying to show the easy or a slightly easier way to see when you pull a three out of that right side, how do you know what it is? Oh, keep change flip. That's the way you do it. Here we go. So you're pulling out a negative three, right? Right? You're pulling out a negative three from both sides, right? Okay. It's very clear for the first one that you're gonna be left with negative three times theta. Everybody's cool with that. It's also pretty clear you're gonna be left with a plus, right? That's pretty clear. All right, but what is, what did you technically do to get theta? You divided by, this is technically dividing by negative three, right? Okay, well, that's just keep change flip. 
That is keep negative pi over 2, right? It's technically negative pi over 2 divided by negative 3. Because that's what you did to the theta to get theta by itself. Okay? So you're going to keep it, change oh, it, that's how we got pi over six. flip it. Now you've got pi over 6. There you go. Oh, that was hard for me to figure out. Sorry that took so long. I couldn't figure out how to know that. But you know what you do if you don't get it right? Or do you know how to know whether you got it right or not? No, do it again. Distribute. Check your thing by distributing. And you'll know, like, is negative 3 over 6 turned into negative pi over 2? Yes. That's how you check it. And then just go try a bunch of different things. If you don't think it's right, go to the other side of it and try making it half of 2, which would be 1. Or a third of 2. You know what I'm saying. So, okay. So that's our thing. So this should, but once we get it here, this tells us all the answers we needed to know. This tells us every single thing we need to know. So what is the uh, phase shift is the second thing they asked for. So we've got an amplitude. Is two a phase shift? Is what? That's just a shift. It's a horizontal shift. Uh, um, is pi over six which way? To the left. Okay, cool. That was pretty easy. You could put the arrow. You could write to the left. You could put negative pi over six. I don't mind. All of them t convey the same thing, and you'll see it when you graph it. Uh, what about the? What's the other thing? Period? What's the formula for period? Isn't it like, no, you have to have like 2 pi over k. And what's k in this case? Negative 3. Yep, so just 2 pi over negative 3. Don't reduce it. Don't be a hero. Just write 2 pi over negative 3 and circle it. You're done. With the answers. So we do have to graph. You do have to graph it, but those answers pretty much tell you what to graph, right? Mm -hmm. So you get... We have like a two, a period of two thirds, and it's the thirds that always get me. Like that's what I'm grabbing. They also get me. I agree. I agree. I will cross my fingers that it's a good thing. But here's how you can garner all the points for the graph and not have to worry about doing it perfectly: is you draw the line that's a two, and you draw the line at negative two, right? That's the first step. You ask yourself, what does sine look like? Does it start at the ground or does it start in the air? What? Does sine start at the base level or does it start up in the air? It starts at zero, right? Because sine of zero is zero. But it actually isn't going to start at zero this time. Where's it going to start at? Negative pi over six. Okay. Starts at negative pi over six. And then where does it finish at? Hmm? It's not technically 2 pi over 3. It takes 2 pi over 3 to finish. Because of the shift? Well, it's to the left. Because it's a horizontal shift, and horizontal is the opposite of what you think it is. So I, sh I should have put a negative here. I, but I put the arrow to the left. My bad. I should have put negative. It's right to be negative. I put that little arrow, or you can write to the left. I was just saying I would give you credit. If you put pi over 6 to the left, if you wrote that out on the blank, I would give you credit because, like, yeah, you get it. Like, that's what we're doing. Yeah. That's not good. It's not good or bad. Answers are answers. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter who grades them. Um, hmm. So how can we go? How <laughs> 2 pi over 3 over? So let's pi over 6 plus 2 pi over 3. This is the worst part. That's technically pi over 6 plus 4 pi over 6, which is 5 pi over 6. So that's where it finishes, 5 pi over 6. And then you can just draw it. It doesn't have to be perfect. I would take that and be done. I would accept that completely. Yeah, but how do we determine that? that was on where it is on the graph? Yeah. I just realized something. Nothing. You're not, you're not doing... That when I freeze the screen, it doesn't freeze my screen on the recording. Oh. Uh -huh. Sneaky, sneaky. That's funny. 
Um, you just have to know where pi over negative pi over six is. If the graph gives it to you with like, what does it usually give you? Like pi over two, negative pi over negative pi, yeah. negative three pi over two, negative two pi. Just put it right there. Just don't go too far. Don't go crazy with it. It doesn't have to be perfect, perfect. That's fine. So for J, um, so we have something that has like to the third, we just have to. I don't think it'll be the third. I think it'll be a two. Right. I think it'll be the points you get are on there. I'm pretty darn sure. Okay. So you just have to um, go by like thirds or something? Yeah. And just be approximate. It doesn't have to be perfect. Label what you do though. Label what you do for sure. All right, what else are we practicing? Number 18? They're all good. Seems like there's a lot from the calculator ones that we're asking about. That's because it's the most recent stuff. Uh, solve a right triangle with the following conditions. Boom, boom, boom. What? Why are we doing this? You know how to do this. Call an angle. Which one do you want to do? You pick. I don't mind. Don't do the 45 because that one's done. So 72. Hypotenuse of 29. All right. Low key, like most of this is already done for us. Are we doing A? What do we know? There's we're just there's six things we got to find. What? Oh. Well, we could have also solved that triangle. They're all good triangles. <laughs> They're all like a triangle is just a triangle. Uh, low key, like we already know one thing for sure. Yeah, what's, what is that? So boom, boom, 90. Which means we also know something else, like real darn sure. Which is? Oh, did you already do it? <laughs> that was fast. 18 degrees? How did it get 18 degrees? Okay, love it. Now we're pretty much almost done, right? This is kind of fun, actually. You could use the not even knowing anything about right triangles um, and solve it. If you did this the law of signs that we did earlier for any triangle, you could use law of signs and be done. Or you could know in your brain, oh, I know real triangle stuff, sine, cosine, tangent, and I could do that. So I don't mind what you want to do. <sighs> Screw it. Let's just do law of signs. Sine of 90 over 12 equals what? Which one do you want to do first? I don't know. They're the same. 18? Okay, cool. Let's call this A. And let's call 18, capital A. Equals the green stuff, which is sine of 18 over A. All right, what's the sine of 90? You know that. You don't even have to do it in your calculator. That's a gimme. Um, isn't it zero? No, one. So you got one over 12 equals sine 18 over A. What do you want to multiply by? A equals sine 18 times 12. A equals sine 18 times 12, which is approximately something. Y'all, watch this. What do you know sine technically is on a separate note? What is the sine technically? Well, okay, yeah, it's technically y, but that's not helpful in this case. I'm saying like what is the like opposite? Over hypotenuse, what's the opposite in this case? So sine of 72, wait, we're doing 18 first. This is the green color, sorry, I shouldn't have changed it to red yet. This is all green. Um, so there's sine of 18, what's the opposite of 18? A, what's the hypotenuse? 12, so A equals what? Look at that. The law of sines or the opposite of right partners give you the same thing. So if you forget the sines, cosine, tangent crap, just go back to that law of sines stuff that we did for every triangle. It works. It's one extra step. The extra step was, what's the sine of 90? That's okay. So what did anybody do that fraction or decimal? I had 3.71. Cool. And we're saying that is A. Okay. Then let's get the blue side. Which we'll call blue side B. Can we use, can we use yeah. The, can we use the Pythagorean theorem? Oh, shoot. Let's do it. Dude, that's fun. Couldn't we use the Pythagorean theorem? Couldn't we say A squared plus B squared 
equals c squared, which means 3.71 squared, plus b squared equals 12 squared, which means b equals big old root of 144 minus 3.71 squared. All right, somebody do that. Caden, will you do the Pythagorean theorem? And then will somebody else do cosine of 72 equals, wait, no, that's wrong. Yeah. I mean, we could have done the cosine of 18, but sine of 72 equals B over 12. So 12 sine 72 is what? That was using the sign. Caden, did you do the, oh, you're about to do the tax? That's what I'm trying to do right now. You, you did both? That's awesome. Okay, so I'm getting um, 11.41. Huh. On the bomb smith. Look at that. We also got that using the sign thing. Isn't that so cool? I've said that so many times this year, haven't I? I've said that so many times that there's no set way to do any of it. Like, even from day one, there's been no, like, this is the way to do it. You go home, you practice, you find the way that you're best at doing it. If you're not sure, come and ask, hey, is this okay? And I'll be like, yeah, so that's perfect. There is no set way to do anything. Like, they all build from the same foundation and just branch out into a million different ways to do the same problem. Heck, even from the time you first learned two times four, there's no set way to do two times four. You can do four plus four plus four plus four because you hate multiplication. Does it take longer? Wait, that's wrong. <laughs> or you can do two plus two plus two plus two, right? This is like the most basic version of what you just said. Is there's no set way to do it? No, there's no set way to do that. And then that's it, right? That's all yeah, that's eight. No, I said that's it. I know, that's a joke. Oh. <laughs> um, so when we write our answer, do we, do, when we write our answer, do we just write like the... Um, triangle label. For most of these triangle answers where it says, okay, that, that's a really good question. Solve. You don't have to do colors. You don't have to be special. But... To answer any of these that say solve, there's a huge blank underneath it. And sometimes they even give you the triangle. You just need to label each of them and circle them. So like label, and it doesn't even have to be perfect labels. So like A is the same A that I want A to be. It can be whatever, but it just needs to be a side. I usually call it A and A, right? An angle, B and B. But would do me the favor of making the same letters opposite. You know what I'm saying? Like... Don't make B opposite of A, but get the right numbers and then just label it crappy. That's true, but terrible. Um, some people like to do alpha, beta, and gamma. By some people, I mean one person. Um, that's fine. But just, yeah, I don't care. When it says solve, it's saying, hey, there's six things on this triangle. Put them where they go so we can see that you know which ones they are. Cool? Look, there's another one. Find the area of the triangles. That's fun. Oh, yeah, no, you know how to do that. One half. A, B. Sine. Theta, you're done. Look, that, that's not it. That's a joke. Dude. Wait, but are you going to put... Yeah, you are. Okay. Well, yes, that's true. <laughs> but, yeah, okay, yeah, be careful with that. No, 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 he's right, he's right. He's right, he's right. That was really important to see. That the angle is actually A in this case. I can't hear what? Non-calculator, which one? Oh, these are my favorite. Yeah. Hey, chill. Um, given the following, identify all six. This is my favorite type of problem because it's literally like, draw that table, can you do all six? Now, I'm fairly certain on the test, it's going to be just asking for one of those six. But if you can do all six, you know the one. I'm pretty sure. I just didn't know which. I didn't want to just tell you, do find one random one. Well, I did that on a test. What, found all six? I did all of them. Yeah, that's smart. I think that's smart. Okay, so here we go. Let's do this one. Given the following conditions, find all six. So here's, there's six things, right? They've given us two of them. That's pretty sweet. Sine 
One fifth. <laughs> that means we know something. Cosecant is five. Cosine is negative root twenty-four over five. That means that the secant is five over root twenty-four with a negative. So the only thing we're missing is tangent. I don't even have to draw the triangle, though it's probably helpful too. Well, yeah, opposite over adjacent, which I see the opposite and the adjacent right above. Anybody see the opposite and adjacent happening right above? The opposite is one because of sine. Negative root 24. How did I know it wasn't on the five? The negative on the bottom. <clears throat> it's never on the hypotenuse for one. It's always on the other thing. And also, because a squared plus b squared equals c squared is why it's never on the hypotenuse. But also, sine is one fifth. Where is that at? Sine is one fifth. What quadrant is that in? Or the second one. Good catch. Cosine is negative 24 over 5. Where is that at? <laughs> or the third one, because it's a negative x value, right? So where is this thing definitely at? There. So that makes it that triangle. What? And that's how we know that triangle. So figure out tangent and boom. All right. Yeah, you part two. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. It is not all just crashed out. But I'm pretty sure that's it. Can you get one over root 24? It's really one fifth over. <gasps> One fifth over root twenty four fifths, and the fives cancel. Yeah. Yeah. So that that means the opposite over adjacent works with sine over cosine as well. So back in there. Hey, hey, this is a really good note. Listen, listen, listen. So tangent technically means what? Opposite over adjacent. But we also said later in the year tangent also means something else for all these identity things. Sine over cosine. So watch this. Even if you didn't know the remember the opposite over adjacent thing, if you took that sine and that cosine and put it over. You get one fifth over one over root twenty four negative. Oh shoot 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 shoot! My bad. Over negative root twenty four over five. Keep one fifth. Change division to multiplication. Flip the bottom fraction. The fives cancel, and you get one over negative root twenty four. I did was I could I could already kind of picture a triangle because the um, five is the hypotenuse. Yeah. And you. Yeah. And then you just knew the opposite over adjacent. That's fine too. So that's why I didn't have to write it as where I cancel off the. That's fine too. Well, like I didn't have to like actually show that I cancel off the fives because I could just say from the back of my head that that it's opposite one over negative. You could see opposite happening. You could see adjacent happening and be like, oh, the, that's tangent. Yeah. Yep. That's a, that's good too. You said 15 as well? Hey, he's not even paying attention. We only have 10 minutes left. Anybody else got another problem? I can. We'll do 7, 16. Well, yeah. But the, that is a lot of practice. No, that's easy. Do that. You got it. Well, which one were you saying? That one right there? Oh, shoot. That is a good one. All right. Hey, here we go. Hey, here we go. That's not fun. But my brain really wants to make it easier than harder. And if, if one thing were changed, this becomes an easy problem. If one thing we're able to change, it becomes an easy problem for both of them. No. The E's still ugly. 
If there wasn't an E, life would be good, right? Oh, well, yeah, obviously. I thought you were going to Like, watch this. If I just gave you this problem with... Oh, I thought you were going to do this one. If, if you just looked at those, those right there, what would be great? For, what would be great if those red things were something? It would be great if those red things were X's. It would be great. No, it'd be great if those were X's. Yeah, X's. Right? So watch this. Watch this. E to the X equals X. Oh my God, that's crazy. So now I'm going to hop over here and I'm going to say, well, this first one's the only kind of weird one. Right? Because where did they get that two from? How can we rewrite e to the 2x? Hmm? What? Can't do that. No. Isn't that x squared the same thing as the... No. Y'all are making it too hard. You could try to do like an L and stuff, but man, I'm saying... I'm saying, isn't Close. No, dude. Y'all are making this way too hard. No, I'm saying, you see the x one, it's right. Can't you just combine the x one? A to the b c equals what? No. A to the b c. A to the b to the c. So e to the x squared minus 2ex minus 3 equals 0. And what did we just say e to the x we could call? Actually, let's not call it x. That's a terrible idea. We should call it u. I don't know why I said x. x is already in there. So now we've got u squared minus 2u minus 3. Y'all are making this way too hard with all this ln stuff. Wait, wait, why did you change it to e x squared? So that I could take this e to the x and make it a u. But it's not, but that's not the same thing. It is. It is the same thing. That's what I was trying to say earlier. Because watch, e to the 2x is technically e to the x times e to the x, right? Right? Yes. Or am I crazy? Well, and I mean, if we multiplied the 2 into it, then it would become 2x. Now you're making me second guess myself. <laughs> oh, no, that's right. Because look, because this is the same rule where you add those two things, right? And x plus x is 2x. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this also is the same thing as something times itself, which is what? E to the x squared. Something times itself is itself squared. Yeah. No, well, no, if you're multiplying two things, then the x is add to 2x. I'm confused. This is the proof of what I wrote. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. Well, so the last time the thing I wrote was how, how e, e x equals u. Okay. So then I went and found all the ex's and switched them for u's. One's right here, there's a u. And one's right here, skip the two, there's a u. U squared. But what do you do with the two? Oh, you squared it. It's staying squared, it's up there, see? And now you know what I do with all those u's? I go u minus three, u, u minus three, u plus one, right? Yes. And you know what u was technically? E to the x. E to the x minus 3. And? And e to the x plus 1. And now you know what we do? We just solve those equations. So you're left with e to the x equals 3. E to the x equals 1. Mm -hmm. 
No, we're almost done. How do you get X by itself? Oh. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I hear you, I hear you. Negative one? How do you get E? How do you get rid of that E? Natural log both sides. And you get X equals the ln of 3. Is that an okay number? That's good to go. You get X equals the ln of negative 1. Is that an okay number? No. Heck no. And there's your answer. Good one to practice, actually. Low key, really good one to go home and practice. The trick was that extra step right there that this is the trick that nobody likes, the sneaky stuff. Why does the one word? Um, domain restrictions that log or natural log can't be negative and can't be zero. Just like how we just say the square root can't be zero. Same way we say square root can't be zero. No, square root can be zero. Square root can't be negative. We say the square root can't be negative. We say the denominator of anything can't be zero. And we say the log or natural log can't be zero or negative. It's the most restrictive thing. Log and natural log are the most restrictive. <laughs> That's just because the graph of log looks like what you were saying earlier, the one you were saying earlier. Graph of log looks like that. X will never be negative, never. Now, ln of X minus three, no wait, plus three, where it shifted over that way, that can have some negative X's. But only up to negative 2, because that still leaves you with the positive in the middle. So it's not saying that the ln can never have a negative in the domain. It's saying that the inside of the ln has to be positive. The inside of the ln has to be positive. Because of that blue graph right there. Because if I try to plug a negative number into that blue graph right there, then why is there ain't there. Then why is there part of the graph in the negative part of the y-axis? Oh, the answer can be negative. The inside of the ln can't be negative. You do the you do the ln of one over a hundred in your calculator real quick. I bet that's negative. I could be wrong, but well, can't. how are you gonna get the negative x's then anyway? You, you never get negative x's. That's what I'm saying. That how come when you shift it to the oh by changing the argument? Same way, you know how we say you can never have a zero on the bottom of a fraction. We say that right. We say you can never have a zero on the bottom of a fraction. But sometimes, you can put zero in the bottom. Right there, you can put a zero in the bottom. You know what you can't put in the bottom? Negative one. It changed what we did to it. But we always say you can never put a zero in the bottom, right? But look right there. There's a zero that goes in the bottom, and it's fine. That's because it changed a little bit of what it did. You can never have a zero on the bottom. You can put a zero in the bottom. Same thing with the ln. You can never have a negative inside of it. You can put a negative inside of there, especially if this is, if you have like the ln of x plus a billion, you can throw a negative one in there and you're going to be fine, right? You can put negative two in there and you're going to be fine. You just can never total have the so negative. Put in a negative. One plus a billion? Oh, yeah. You see what I'm saying? You can put a negative number in there. You can't have a negative number as your total argument. Cool? I know it's kind of weird.